Hi guys, Lucas here. Welcome back to the channel. I hope you guys are doing well. As you know, I recently did an unboxing and reaction video regarding my experience with a couple of Eert guitars. As I mentioned before, Eert is making a push to get more of their products into the market, and I've been seeing this brand all over social media lately, particularly on a lot of smaller YouTube channels like mine. If you missed my original video, I'll put a link up here in the card so that you can check that out. It might be worth having a look just so that you have an idea of the backstory because there is a bit of a backstory to this one. If you're new here and you like guitar related content, lessons, gear reviews, and DIY projects, please consider subscribing to the channel. Also click that bell icon to get notified every time I upload new content. And to my returning subscribers, thank you so much for your continued support. There are really two reasons why I bought an ear guitar in the first place. One, I wanted to see if they were as good as everyone is saying they are. And two, well, I hoped that they were. This is video two on ear guitars, and to steal a phrase from Landon Bailey, we're going to do a deep dive. I will completely disassemble the guitar so we can take a look at the build quality. We're going to check out the uh, bridge, the electronics, the neck, the fretwork, and the tuners. And we'll check to see how easily you could replace the pick guard and mod the guitar if you wanted to do some upgrades. The goal here is to determine if it really is as good as people say it is. Are you getting your money's worth? Finally, I've also added some sound samples throughout the video as well. In each example, I'll play through all five pickup positions so you can hear them all. There are clean, distorted, and blue samples for you to check out, and all the samples were recorded using my Helix and the signal chain is pretty simple. It's just the guitar into the Helix and into the DAW with no EQ or effects. The tones are based off of a deluxe reverb in the vibrato channel and I wanted to use the Helix for this because I wanted the purest signal I could get and I didn't want any of the challenges that are associated from miking a guitar amp. Before we get into this I want to clarify one point. Firstly, I was really surprised at the response to the previous video about these guitars. Thank you to all of you who took time to share your thoughts. It's always appreciated. It seems like I'm not the only one who's curious about this brand. One thing that struck me is that some of you felt that I was nitpicking. That's totally fair. But the only point that I would like to make is that anything that you buy that is new should be free of defects. It seems that a lot of folks felt I should give this brand a pass because based on the features, it would be more expensive if it was say a Fender or an Ibanez or some other well-known brand made in some other part of the world. Keep in mind, it's not. This is a guitar that's made in China. The labor and the components used to make it are less expensive than the equivalent made elsewhere. So in reality, it should be less expensive. Finally, I feel as consumers, we have to hold manufacturers accountable regarding the quality of products that they put into the marketplace. I'd feel the same uh, whether this was a $200 Fender Squire or a $3,000 Fender Custom Shop model. When it's new, it should be free of defects regardless of the price. If that's nitpicking, then by all means, call me picky. With that out of the way, let's get into the video. All right, so I've loosened the strings off and pulled them out. And this is, uh, this guitar will never come to a gig. It will never go to a show. Because, come on, try as I might, I actually have to put an Allen key in the end here and try to pound these strings out. They don't, I can't even push them out with my, oh yeah, I guess I can. Some of them I can push out, but I mean, they're in there. So, I don't know. I guess I'd probably have an Allen key with me at a gig, but I still think that's kind of a pain in the ass. Okay, so we've got the strings off the guitar. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull the, the trem off. I can't get the bar out. <laughs> it will not come out, which is kind of weird. So anyway, I wanted to take it apart and have a look at it anyway. So I'm going to do that. But first, unfortunately, I've got to... Uh, I'm gonna pop these springs off, so I'm gonna do that. There we go. So we're gonna take that trim right out of there and have a look at it. It's got a good weight to it. You know, it seems like a nice trim. I just, uh, I like the way it works. It stays in tune really well. I have no issues with any of that. I just, I'm not crazy about, um, I'm not crazy about how the strings get stuck in there. I know a lot of you guys have commented that that is uh, totally normal. It's got a small set screw here as well, so I'm guessing you can um, put a little more tension on this and crank it in place at the moment, though. I can't get the bar out. Oops, I just dropped the set screw. There we go. That was in there pretty good. What kind of metal that is, if it's just a steel or what. All right, so I've decided I'm gonna go ahead and Pull this off of here, I want to see what this is like. So 
so you can see where the um, the height adjustment screws have dug into this. It's like a plating on the top of this. So now I'm going to remove this from the block. Well, I don't know guys. That's what we're looking at anyway. Next, I'm going to pull the neck off the guitar. We'll have a look at that. So here we are on the back side. I really like the neck on this guitar, other than the uh, obvious attempts to cover up the flaws on it. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it actually is a, it's a decent neck. It certainly has potential. I don't see anything kind of out of the ordinary here. This is a nice, uh, nice joint here. It was fairly snug in there. I like how they've kind of carved off the, um, edges of the fingerboard here down at the bottom end where the heel is. Um, this may not show up in camera, but for those of you guys who saw the first video, you know I have these um, little metal pins that you can see on the fingerboard here. And you can see where somebody tried to cover one up here as well. Those are supposedly fretboard location pins, um, which is not something you really should see on a fingerboard. The nut is pretty well cut on this guitar. I don't see any real issues there. There's another shot of the nut. Hopefully that is easy enough for you guys to see. I'll try and get some better shots in there, but overall I think the, the nut is, is pretty well done on this guitar. No issues with it here. It's nicely, nicely lined up where it should be. All right, so there's a look at the, the neck pocket. Hopefully you guys can make that out. I'll throw a couple of photos in there also. Nothing really surprising there. Kind of a chunk taken out here. So now I think we'll go ahead and we'll take these knobs off here, see what we're dealing with there. When I originally checked these out, I thought they were metal. Oh, that Allen key is too small. 
So that would be kind of cool if they are. Let's see what we got here. So we'll pop these off and see what we've got. They certainly feel like metal. They're not at all magnetic though. But that doesn't mean, I guess, that they're not. I don't know. I don't know much about alloys. Let's see, what do they sound like? I don't know. Ding! I think they're metal, which is kind of cool. All right. Okay, so now we can watch me uh, do the most boring job in the world. I'll take out all these screws here so we can get this pick guard off and have a look at it. All right, time for the big reveal. What do we got here? Who am I? So I want to get a close up of the wiring here. One YouTuber reviewed this exact model of guitar and described the wiring as a work of art. I would respectfully disagree. It's quite busy in here. We have some ceramic bottom single coils. These are made by a company called Artec. They are plastic bobbins. Um, you can get these pretty cheap uh, online. They are spec as a vintage style. Um, I peeled this sticker off and had a look for the product code there as well. I found this humbucker online for about nine bucks. Uh, so again, pretty inexpensive, but that was to be expected uh, on a guitar of this price range. We do have full size uh, 500K pots. The full size pots are kind of a nice touch. Um, and of course we've got a five way switch here as well. Some of the soldering is nice. Some of the soldering, not so much. As I said, it is quite busy in here. Um, we've also got a treble bleed circuit, uh, which is also kind of a nice touch as well. Um, although on with 500K pots, I'm finding it really Really harsh and fizzy on the top end when you roll the volume down. For me, I'm not personally a fan with this kind of a setup. And also, I think if you're just playing the guitar at home, your bedroom player, this setup is fine. But if you're going to go play a gig, you're going to need some shielding and some insulation, and you're going to want to replace these pick pickups as well, for sure. If you were going to take this guitar out to a gig, I think you'd find a lot of noise as soon as you stepped under the lights. So you're definitely going to want to insulate this. And to change out the electronics, you're going to run into a bit of a snag because unfortunately this pickup or this pick guard is not a direct um, drop in in terms of the way the holes and things line up. We're going to take a closer look at that in a minute. But first, I'm going to go ahead and put some copper shielding in here to bring the noise down.
right, so I thought I would just check and see. This is a pick guard that was on on my Highway 1 Strat, yeah, which is, of course, American-made. And I just wanted to see if the if this would line up and fit on here, and it really would not be um, kind of exact. You have some holes that you would have to either modify or be willing to make in order to actually get this to fit. Now, of course, too, you'd have to keep in mind that you need to compensate for the um, the wheel here. Uh, but I just wanted to see if a standard kind of off-the-shelf pickguard would fit, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to get it to fit properly without making some modifications. I think that's really important to note because, um, pardon the mess, <laughs> if you're not really sold on uh, mint green for example or if you wanted to switch it to a single coil setup uh, you'd have to be willing to maybe i think the best thing to do would be to plug the holes and then just drill new ones for your uh, for your new pick guard i decided that uh, i'd go ahead and do one upgrade would be to actually put some copper shielding in here and put some copper shielding on the pick guard as well there's lots of videos online how to do that if you're not sure so i'm going to go ahead and put the components back in the pick guard put the ground back in and uh, start to reassemble the guitar all right so i've got the uh, pickups mounted back in i've got uh, the copper shielding done everywhere i've done my continuity test to make sure that i have continuity every everywhere inside the body and everywhere on the pick guard as well so that's cool and i've got to put my um my ground screw uh, back in the body so that's what i'm going to do it was located somewhere around here i forget exactly where it was so i don't think it's really too critical i'm maybe just going to put it over here so it's a little bit out of the way be super careful when you're doing that you don't want a hole in the body i'm just drilling basically a, a small pilot hole to um, so that i can start the screw I'm sure my hands are probably completely in the way here. <laughs> but anyway, this is a relatively simple um, upgrade that you can do and it's pretty cheap too. So there we go. So now we should have a nice, uh, nice ground there and we should have continuity. All right, so a simple way to check is just to um, plug a lead in and then plug the other end into an amp. Obviously you don't want it up too loud. Just check uh, that your volume isn't up all the way here. And then all you gotta do is just tap the uh, pickup with uh, something metal, tap the pull piece. So here it should be these two. So that's just the middle, middle and humbucker and humbucker. Anyway, let me screw this back together. I've got a set of locking tuners kicking around here. so. They happen to fit, so I'm going to go ahead and install them. Um, these tuners here, they're okay. You know, they're they're adequate. They keep the guitar in tune. Um, I've got a couple that make a bit of a grinding, not a grinding noise, but they, they just don't feel as smooth as maybe they could. So uh, I figure, why not? I've got these lockers laying around, so I'm going to go ahead and throw them on. If you're ever looking at a guitar neck and you're wondering if it's roasted maple or not, the easiest way to check is to unscrew something and look at the wood all the way through. Because roasted maple will be the same color all the way through. And there you go. In seven minutes, you have locking tuners.
primary purpose for purchasing this guitar was really the neck. That's what drew me to it probably more than anything. So I thought it would be good to um, try to give you guys a great look at it. And what I wanted to do was use a fret rocker. So if you're not familiar with this tool, what it does is it allows you to check whether or not the frets on the guitar are level. The first thing you, you want to do is use um, a slotted ruler like this and set your um, neck relief. So you can see there I've set it, it's basically flat, which is pretty much where I like to try to set my, my guitars. You can use the truss rod to adjust that. So I like to set mine pretty well flat. And then um, I would do that first. And then the way the fret rocker works is that you place it one of these four sides across three frets at a time and you see if the fret will rock. If the fret will rock, then it tells you that you have unlevel frets. And really what you want to do when you do this is you want to check the frets um, all the way across the width of the neck because sometimes you'll have them level here and then you can come up here and they might be there might be a high spot. But so as you can see the first three, those are pretty good. We're gonna go here to this group now. And you kind of hear that. That's not bad really, but there's a there's a there's a high spot on this fret right here. It's not really a big deal though. See, that one's pretty high right there. I don't know if you can see that. It's not too bad, but you can see the fret rocker rocking there. Anyway, let me zoom back out and we'll continue on. This one's not, not bad, but you can hear that sound. That's a giveaway that. There's a bit of an issue. So here I'm starting to get kind of too close to the frets. Um, let me just move this, sorry. A bit close there, so you might want to switch and use the shorter side here. And those are really good. So you can see a little bit there. But again, not too bad. This guitar, um, Oops. This guitar was significantly better than the first one. The reason this is important is because if you've got um, a really bad uh, fret job, it will make um, it will make getting the action set the way you want it, you know, really difficult. So now we're going to switch to this setup here. Do you hear that sound? This one's not bad though, but it's, you know, it's definitely not perfect, but. Let me just continue to move the camera, guys. I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, not always the best at this stuff. I apologize, but. Get the camera to stop shaking for a second. See, so this is a great example. It's high here, but here it's good. Okay, now we're here. So is that one gonna span? Still a little tight. So ultimately for me, You know, this is pretty decent. I really don't have too many complaints on it, but. All right, so that gives you an idea how you check it. And this guitar, um, the frets are actually pretty decent on this one. All right, so the next thing I thought we would do is we would just check the output uh, of these pickups. So with the volume and tone controls all the way up and a small lead, uh, plugged into the input of the guitar here, you can check your output of your pickup. So um, that's pretty low. There's our neck pickup at 5.15. We'll go to the middle. 
5.30, which is also kind of on the low side. I'm surprised actually. Oh wow, and the humbucker is like off the charts at 16.19. So what are my final thoughts on this guitar? Well, if it was a piece of real estate, I'd refer to it as a handyman special. Let me explain. First of all, let's start with the electronics. I should say that I fully expected to have to replace the electronics on this guitar when I bought it. So for me, that really doesn't come as a surprise. It might come as a surprise to you though, and that's why I thought it was important to bring it up. These Artec single coils are nothing special. Um, they're a plastic bobbin ceramic pickup, and you can buy a full set of three of these for about 30 bucks online. Um, you can bet that Yurt is probably paying a lot less for them than that. The pickups to me seem mismatched as well. Um, the single coils are really low output, like you would expect in maybe a 50s or 60s style guitar, and the humbucker is pretty hot, and it's kind of maybe more suited to higher gain stuff. I think what Yurt should do is maybe you know pick a style and then equip the pickups to kind of match that style but I think the biggest miss here though is that Yurt made no effort whatsoever to shield those pickups from unwanted noise if you watch my sound samples closely you can tell that I'm fighting the noise when using positions 5 3 and 2 I think in a bar under stage lights those positions would be pretty much unusable um, you definitely want to shield this guitar it's nice that they used full-size pots and a treble bleed but the wiring and soldering is definitely on the messy side um, to me it's not at all the work of art that another YouTuber told me it would be. In fact, he specifically said that they use capacitors that you wouldn't find on a guitar in this price range. To put a little perspective on that, you can buy a full-size 500k alpha pot on Alibaba for 11 cents each if you're buying in bulk, and I'm pretty sure that's what you would be doing. Not really a reason to pull your wallet out of your pocket, in my opinion. In my case, a standard 11-hole pick guard won't fit the guitar, so if you want to change the pickup configuration to something other than HSS, or you don't like the mid-bringing pick guard that's on the guitar, you'll have to make further modifications to the body in order to change it. Another thing to note is that something like a solderless wiring harness like the ones made by Obsidian Wire won't fit the existing pick guard because the spacing for the volume and tone control pots is incorrect. What was really interesting though was a comment by Ken M on my first video about these guitars. Ken noted that in his case, the routing inside the pickup cavity was too shallow to allow him to install the components he wanted and he had to route the body to make it work. His comments make a lot of sense to me. Let me explain. One thing I didn't show in the video is I had a hell of a time to remove the humbucker from the pick guard. The reason is that someone had cut the screws off that go into the pickup mount, presumably because they were too long. Why they didn't just use a shorter screw is beyond me, but as a result, the screws wouldn't thread in or out of the pickup mounts where they had been cut. On top of that, the ends of the screws were insanely sharp. Quality stuff, folks. Um, Ken also said that his guitar had a crack in the neck pocket like the one I have on the NKC3 over there and that the nut measured a non-standard 41 millimeters. In my case, the nut on the CP1 did measure 42 millimeters, but these are really important points. So Ken, I wanna take a moment and thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, so what would normally be a simple electronics upgrade if this was say a made in Mexico fender is now a heck of a lot more work and if that body cavity is too shallow like in Ken's case then I've just wasted my time with the copper shielding because that would have to be removed to route the body in order to get the depth I need to install what I want to put in. All right let's talk about the bridge. The bridge functions well enough on its own. I was able to float it and you know kind of have reasonable tuning. Um, it looks nice enough and it has a good weight to it. But for me, I hate how much extra time and effort is needed to get the strings out of the block. Um, the low E is particularly bad. I've done three or four string changes and I have to insert an Allen key into the hole and then tap it with something in order to get it out. Like you saw in the video, I can't even push it out by hand. In my last string change, the Allen key actually managed to get wedged between the ball end of the string and the trim block and I had to putz around with it to get it out. It's fiddly stuff like this that to me just isn't worth it. It's also worth noting that the first time I ever tried to remove the bar from the trim was when I made this video. You probably saw me fighting to get the bar out uh, even when the set screw was removed from the trim block. So if you plan to take this guitar out of your house to jam sessions or whatever, you'll need to be able to pop that in bar in and out because you generally you can't close a hard shell case with the bar in. I haven't had time to check the post spacing and sizing for a replacement bridge. I'm hoping that there's no kind of oddball surprises there in terms of sizing, but I won't know for sure until I check. If you've already been down this rabbit hole and you know, then you know, please drop a comment below to help the rest of us out. Also, I gotta admit, I'm not super knowledgeable at different types of steel. So if you know what kind of steel we have here in this block, uh, please you know, leave a comment and, and let us know.
Regarding the tuners, these are okay. You know, I was starting to get a bit of kind of some noise and stuff in a couple of them, but they worked well enough to keep the guitar in tune. Um, you know, you probably don't need to change them out, but I switched mine out because I happened to have a, a set of locking tuners laying around that, you know, wasn't doing anything. But I think you'd get away with those stock tuners that come in the guitar. Regarding the neck, on the plus side, on the neck on this one is decent, aside from the visible fretboard location pins, that is. I mean, honestly, in almost 40 years of playing guitar, I've never seen this on any guitar I've ever played. If you've ever seen this, let me know in the comments. I'm still a little perplexed by this, to be honest. And in fact, two of these pins are so close together that you would think one of them would have been redundant. Playability on the guitar is good and the action's decent as well, but to get the very best out of this, I'd have to do a full fret level crown and polish. I do believe this neck is roasted maple, but on that topic, please be very, very careful about the reviews you watch on this brand of guitars. There's a lot of confusion about the specifications, and I think it's due um, in part to the language barrier when translating to English. I've seen a lot of videos where guys are describing the lower end models, like the NKC3 that I have here, um, as having roasted maple necks. I even did that myself on the same guitar, and I can tell you after taking it apart, I can confirm for you that it is 100% not a roasted maple neck. I'm really sorry about that, and of course, um, that's a huge letdown if you happen to plunk down your hard-earned cash on that, so please be careful. Regarding the frets, they might be stainless steel, but it's really worth noting that there's a lot of different types of steel. I can tell you that both the Eart guitars I have here turned my fingertips black when I first started playing them. Neither Eart guitar uh, felt as smooth as the Jeskar frets on my 7 7 Strat or the stainless steel frets I've had on my Warmoth and Kiesel necks over the years. They also aren't quite as shiny. So for me, the jury is still out on these. Um, I suspect the quality is not as good, but hopefully they will offer the same benefits long term. I really like the body of this guitar. The neck joint is quite nice, as are the contours, and I like the accessibility to the upper frets. And the body does appear to be mahogany as it's spec. It's worth noting that the paint on mine is quite thin. It didn't take me a lot of effort to scratch, um, you know, kind of a thin layer off the inside of the body cavity where I was hoping to find that shielding paint. So don't expect a thick, durable poly finish that you would find like on a fender. Personally, I don't really care about that, but it is something that you should be aware of. So I think by now you can kind of see what I mean when I use the term handyman special. Um, on Amazon.ca, the Eart CPU one is selling for 505 Canadian dollars. In the time of filming this, I couldn't find this on Amazon.com, but I've seen these on eBay.com for around 440 US dollars. So when you start adding pickups, electronics, maybe a bridge, some shielding, maybe a new pick guard, um, you could easily bring this guitar up to you know 750 to 1,000 dollars here in Canada. And on top of that, you need the skills and the tools to do the upgrades. If you can, then you might end up with a pretty decent guitar for a thousand. It's a lot of time and effort to get it there and you're still gambling that the frets and the neck will hold up long term. So if you're handy and you're looking to take a chance and have a project, then you know maybe buy one of these from Amazon or somewhere with a no haggle return policy so you can get rid of it if you wind up getting one that has more issues than you're comfortable with. At least now though, you have some idea of kind of what you're getting yourself into. If you're not handy, I would take a hard pass on this and I'd look elsewhere. For 500 bucks, you could buy something like a Fender Contemporary Special, which features a roasted maple neck with a 12 inch radius. It's got Alnico pickups instead of ceramic uh, pickups. And because it's a Fender, um, upgrades would be super simple because anything you could ever want to install would fit. Anyhow, that's my two cents. I realize this might be a little bit different than what a lot of others are saying, but it is based on my own personal experience with two of this brand's products. Um, in my opinion, no new item should ever ship with quality defects, period. If it does, you should send it back, you know, unless you're the kind of person that hates the suit despite the fly. You're not that kind of person, are you? Yeah, I didn't think so. Anyhow, guys, thank you so much for sticking with me through this one. Um, it's been a lot of work to put this video together. It's taken me a lot of time. I hope it's helpful for you. I hope it's useful for you. Uh, I am planning to do something similar with the NKC3 as well. And I think once I'm done with that guitar, I'd like to give it away. I'd like to pay it forward. So stay tuned to the channel for news on that. I have to learn the ins and outs of the rules for that. Thanks again so much for watching. And to quote the late, great BB King, once you learn something, nobody can take it away from you. Thanks for watching. Cheers.